Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Accounting Pronouncements, What You Need to Know. All participants will be placed on mute during the presentation, but during the Q&A session, feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions. You can also submit them through the chat function in the webinar app. This webinar will be recorded. The recording and the slide deck will be sent out within a few days. CPE credit is available to attendees who answer all four poll questions scattered throughout the presentation. If you are looking to get CPE, you must answer all four poll questions to be eligible. If you qualify, the CPE certificates will be sent to you via email within the next few weeks. Finally, there will be a survey that appears on your screen at the end of the webinar. Your feedback is very important to us and we want to provide you with as much value as possible through these webinars. If you would take a few minutes to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. For those of you who may not be familiar, familiar with Richie May, we were founded almost 40 years ago to focus exclusively on the needs of the mortgage banking industry. This singular focus from our experts enables us to help lenders accomplish their goals. Our experts believe in the forward progress and success of the industry, and dedicate much of their time to teaching through webinars like this and building others through the MBA School of Mortgage Banking and at other industry conferences and associations. And now I would like to turn it over to our expert presenters today. Christina. Thank you, Felicia. Hi, I'm Christina Lucas, the Senior Audit Manager here at Richie May, and looking forward to talking to you about two standard updates, a CECL and convertible debt instruments. Over to you, Chad. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Chad Murphy, and I'm an assurance partner at Richie May within the mortgage banking practice. Richard? Oh, Richard. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Guy. I'm a manager here in the mortgage audit practice, and I'm looking forward to talking about uh, some changes to goodwill and some stock compensation uh, issues. Over to you, Brian. Hi, and then yeah, I'm Brian Lapine, and I'm an audit lead in the mortgage banking audit department as well. Thank you, Brian. Okay, everybody, welcome to Accounting Pronouncements webinar. Uh, we did our best to consolidate all the material covered today in one hour, so bear with us. We're going to go over announcements, uh, accounting standard updates that were issued in 2023 by the FASB that either go into effect in the next year or so. We will also be talking about accounting standard updates that happened and were issued prior but go into effect this year, as well as some other older accounting standard updates that may be more applicable in 2023 in case you forgot about them. Um, yes, so we're listing out all the accounting standard updates in the next couple of slides. The first slide is the 2023 accounting standard updates and I kind of made a reference which ones we'll be covering in this webinar as we could cover all of them. Uh, the next slide is some 2022 ASUs that either go into effect this year or might have some impact in 2023. And the last two were kind of ones that we brought back <clears throat> if they had current accounting standard updates or we felt may be more applicable in this 2023 year. Okay, I'm going to kick it over to Chad to go through common control and lease agree arrangements. Over to you, Chad. Thank you, Christina. Um, today, I'll be discussing three standard updates. Update 2023-01, leases, common control arrangements. Update 2022-05, financial services transition for sold contracts. And update 2022-01, derivatives and hedging, fair value hedging for portfolio layer method. So let's jump into the lease update for common control arrangements. This ASU will only impact entities that have related party or common control arrangements. And if you do have common control arrangements, this update will alleviate time and costs in accounting for these common control arrangements. And for purposes of this webinar, when I say common control arrangements, think related party arrangements as these are interchangeable. Next slide. For this update, we will go through the timing of when the update will go into effect, the main provisions of the ASU, how to implement, and its impact. Next slide. <clears throat> For the effective day, all entities will be required or able to apply as a practical expedient in the ASU for fiscal years beginning after 12-15-2023. So this will impact the current 2023 audit period. 
early adoption is permitted in any annual or interim period as of the beginning of the related fiscal year. Next slide. Okay, so what is new with the uh, ASU? Well, in March 2023, the FASB issued, again, ASU 2023-01, which admitted certain provisions of ASC 842 that apply to arrangements between related parties under common control. There are two different issuances within this update, which is labeled as Issue 1 and Issue 2. Issue 1 is an optional practical expedient allowed for private entities only, and the second is required by all entities. For issue one, this will allow com private companies to elect a practical expedient to account for common control leasing arrangements using the written terms and conditions without having to determine if those terms and conditions are legally enforceable. For issue two, uh, it, this amends the accounting for leasehold improvements in common control arrangements for all entities. Next slide. A little background as to why the FASB made these changes. For the first issue under previous lease guidance, topic 840 required entities to classify and account for related party arrangements on the basis of economic substance, meaning if you were paying for the use of an asset, a lease was in place regardless of legal documentation. However, ASC 842 then changed this by requiring all related party leases to be accounted for according to the legally enforceable terms and conditions. So meaning if a company needs to go through that practice of hiring someone to draft out a legally enforceable contract, which then becomes costly. The new ASU that we are discussing today is similar to the legacy guidance of ASC 840 by allowing entities to rely only on the written terms and conditions without worrying if that agreement is legally enforceable. Next slide. <clears throat> now on to issue two regarding leasehold improvements. Previously, ASC 842 required the lessee to amortize leasehold improvements over the shorter term of the remaining lease term or the useful life of the improvements. So no difference between how to amortize related or unrelated party leasehold improvements. But the issue is in many cases, common control arrangements or related party arrangements can have a shorter term while the useful life of the asset is typically much longer. And this is typically because when a lease ends, another party is still owns and controls that asset. So related party improvements may have a much longer anticipated useful life than a normal leasehold improvement. This has led concerns that the current accounting treatment does not accurately reflect the economics of those arrangements since the asset provides benefits for both parties in the agreement. Next slide. <clears throat> so now how do we move forward with a new ASU? For issue one, private companies that elect a practical expedient will use the written terms and conditions of a common control arrangement to determine whether a lease exists without considering if the terms are legally enforceable. They may be applied on an arrangement by arrangement basis. And if no written terms and conditions exist, companies are prohibited from applying the practical expedient and have to apply the existing guidance by evaluating if enforceable terms and conditions of that arrangement exist. Now remember, just because you elect the practical expedient, it doesn't allow you to automatically not record these leases under ASC 842 you still need to one, have documentation of the written terms and conditions, and two, evaluate um, if those written terms and conditions are an actual lease. Next slide. So for issue two, regardless of the lease term, leasehold improvements associated with leases between entities under common control are to be amortized over the useful life of the improvements, as long as the lessee controls the use of the asset through a lease. If a lessee no longer controls the use of the underlying asset, that remaining value of the improvements is accounted for as a transfer between common control entities through an adjustment to equity. There's also additional disclosure requirements such as the unamortized balance of the leasehold improvements at that balance sheet date, the remaining useful life of the leasehold improvements to the common control group, and the remaining lease term. Next slide. Now, how do we implement the ASU? For issue one, entities may choose one of the following options. So you'll choose either pro prospectively to arrangements that commence or are modified on or after the date that the entity first applies the practical expedient or retrospectively to the beginning of the period in which the entity first applied topic 842. Next slide. <clears throat> For issue two, entities may choose the following options. Apply the change prospectively to all new improvements or prospectively to all new and existing improvements, or lastly, retrospectively to the beginning of the period, which will then require a modified cumulative adjustment to your opening equity. Next slide. 
So now how will the new ASU impact our financials? For issue one, entities will no longer need to seek legal counsel or extensively analyze their lease contracts to determine legally enforceable terms and conditions of the arrangement, which will reduce overall cost. However, entities that do anticipate becoming a public entity should consider the impact of reversing out the practical expedient as this is not allowed for public entities. For issue two, this will result in a higher expense in the earlier years of the lease, but a lower expense in the later years. Next slide. Okay, so now that we'll, we'll be going over our first polling question. Our first polling question will be, does your company have common control arrangements? Yes, no or does not apply, maybe, or I am not sure. We will give everyone about a minute to answer this question. Hello, everyone. Make sure that you do vote if you're interested in the CPE credit. We only have about 78% of you answered so far. So I want to give the rest of you just a moment. If you're interested in answering this question, we need you to do it right now. Okay, I see some last minute ones coming in. Again, we're a little over a minute, but I really do want all of you who want CP credit to get it. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close this poll now. And let me share the results so you can talk about them a bit. <clears throat> awesome, so yeah, it looks like most of them do not apply, which again, this is not for you, which is great, because I know everyone's pretty exhausted with the whole leasing update in general. And the ones that do say yes, um, I think, you know, that is going to actually help you in the long run to alleviate some cost and some uh, undue time that's needed for these contracts or agreements. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> okay, so now the next two standards that I will be going over will be rather quick as the impact is minimal to our uh, client base. The next ASU I'll be reviewing is ASU 2022-05, Financial Services, Transition for Sold Contracts, which is an amendment to several previous amendments on a transition requirement for insurance entities that top that follow topic 944. If you are unfamiliar with the previous ASU or ASEs regarding this update, then this will not apply to you. Next slide. We'll be going through the timing of the ASU and the main provisions. Next slide. Um, for the effective date, SEC entities, smaller, smaller reporting entities excluded, will be for fiscal years beginning after 12-15-2022, while all other entities will be for fiscal years beginning after 12-15-2024. Next slide. I'm gonna jump right into a little background on the new ASU. In 2018, the FASB issued 2018-12, which is the main amendment to make targeted improvements to its guidance on long duration contracts issued by an insurance entity. Again, the majority of our clients do not follow topic 944, so these amendments would not impact you. For our clients that do follow topic 944, these amendments will unlikely impact you as we have not seen any of them holding long duration contracts. Um, so then since uh, the original 2018 amendment, the FASB has provided several updates, including the one we are discussing today, that have delayed the effective date as well as providing accounts, accounting policy elections that have eased the burden of implementation. If you do feel that these amendments do impact you or you are unsure, please reach out to us, discuss further as we can provide more detail on the ASUs. Next slide. All right, so now I'll finish up my ASUs by discussing the derivatives and hedging, fair value hedging on the portfolio layer method. Next slide. We will discuss the timing of the ASU, the main provisions, how to implement, and the impact for our clients. Next slide. For the effective date, SEC entities will be for fiscal years beginning after 12-15-2022, while all other entities fiscal years beginning after 12-15-2023. Next slide. So a little bit about the ASU. In August 2017, the FASB issued ASU 2022-01 clarifying guidance within the ASC 815 
regarding the portfolio layer method of fair value hedge accounting for interest rate hedges a portfolio of prepayable financial assets such as loans. The ASU allows entities to hedge multiple layers rather than just a single layer of closed portfolio of financial assets. Uh, the good news here is, is that IMBs will not be impacted by this update. While mortgage lenders commonly do utilize certain derivative instruments to mitigate interest rate risk, these instruments are typically accounted for as a freestanding derivative instrument and are not designated for hedge accounting. And again, this ASU impacts hedge accounting. Next slide. <clears throat> A little background on ASU is prior to this ASU, entities had difficulty achieving fair value hedge accounting for interest rate risk of prepayable financial assets regarding those uh, closed portfolios. The previous guidance only allowed an entity to hedge assets in a closed portfolio that is anticipated to be outstanding for the designated hedge period. For example, if an entity had $100 million closed portfolio loans, but only 50 million of those, of those were expected to remain outstanding for at least 15 years, they could then only hedge a single layer of $50 million for a period of 15 years. Under the new portfolio layer method, the entity is able to hedge the entire $100 million under multiple layers based on when prepayment occurs over different periods of time. Next slide. So now how do we implement this ASU if you are impacted? <clears throat> Upon adoption, an entity can designate multiple hedge layers of a single closed portfolio, and all entities are required to apply the ASU on a modified retrospective basis by making a cumulative effect adjustment to your opening equity. Um, so again, this is not impactful to our mortgage lenders out there, but if there are entities that do hedge accounting and have further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Okay, so now I will turn this over to Christina to discuss other anticipated pronouncements. Thank you all. Thanks, hey, Chad. Hi, everybody. So I will be going over two accounting standard updates. The first one will be covering credit losses, this new CECL model we keep hearing about. And the next one will be on convertible instruments, specifically if you're thinking about debt financing and equity financing. So we'll first go into the credit losses, the CECL model. Okay, so I will cover in this next couple of slides, why do we have this accounting standards update? Uh, what's the timing of it? When does it go into effect? You know, what is it and how to implement it, some best practices, and then how would it impact your financials and disclosure notes? Okay, so the current existing GAAP methodology that's in place is known as this incurred loss model related to credit losses. And what this accounting standards update wants to do is get rid of this incurred loss model and move to an expected loss model. The reason being uh, the board and users of the financials felt that they were restricted with their ability to record credit losses because there was this probability threshold in this old incurred loss model methodology. So if they knew a credit loss was coming, it was expected, is there a way that we can put this on the books because the users of financials were already kind of devaluating their financial statement, accounting for that, but companies couldn't recognize that credit loss yet. So with this new methodology, it's saying, yes, let's recognize this credit loss immediately, um, we're going to establish allowance to, for expected credit losses over the life of the asset, and we need to incorporate this whole reasonable and supportable forecasting in this model. So left-hand side kind of walks through, you know, the timing of how this accounting standards update came to be. We'll go back to 2008 with the financial crisis, with banks not being able to recognize future expected losses in their loan loss reserves. However, users of financials were already marking down those expected losses off the books. So they wanted to kind of marry the two current guidance, like bring it up to date with what people were actually using that information for. So the FCAG was created in December, 2008. That's the Financial Crisis Advisory Board to address some of these concerns around financial reporting resulting from the financial crisis when the drill down efforts were with credit losses. So by June, 2016, uh, there was accounting standards update on CECL, which is current expected credit losses. This has already been into effect for SEC filers in calendar years 2020. For everybody else, it's now. Now's the time, uh, 2023, this goes into effect. So do we know if this impacts you or not? Let's talk about it in the next couple of slides. So within this ASU, it kind of broke into two provisions. 
the one that I'll be talking more about in the next few slides will be the assets measured at amortized costs, specifically loan sale for investment. You also had another provision mentioned in this ASU available for sale debt securities. So let's circle back to these assets measured at amortized costs. What this ASU is saying, okay, how do we get to our net carrying value of amount expected to be collected? So we're gonna back into our amortized cost basis of this financial asset or your loan sale for investment in that portfolio loan. And then we'll add in this allowance for credit losses to get to our amount expected to be collected. It's not gonna be a write down of your amortized cost basis, it's a valuation account, so like a contra asset. So within this ASU, it kind of lists out, here's the accounts we expect to be significantly impacted. On the right-hand side are accounts that we didn't see there was a direct impact. Um, I will mention servicing advances is in bold on the right-hand side of not direct impact because it kind of is how you're looking at this. So we do expect there to be a reserve on these servicing advances. The question in being, and there's a difference of opinion at the moment of, is this future forecasting? Do we need to apply that and drill down with the CECL model? Or is just using current conditions historical um, analysis good enough? And what we're saying right now is please contact your audit partner to have that discussion because it kind of is a case by case basis. What's in that portfolio? What's going in the advances receivable piece of it? Um, so please be sure to have that discussion to make sure if there should be a CECL model applied or not. Um, on the left hand side, I bolded loan sales for investment to make the distinction of loan sale for investment has the CECL model applying loans held for sale that are aged, that are carried at um, lower cost or fair value, um, doesn't have this application of the CECL model as it's already considered to be included in that change in fair value. So if you're not sure, do I have loans held for investment on my hands? Do I have aged loans held for sale? I kind of put a side-by-side -side comparison of what you're looking at. If you're still unsure, let's have that discussion with your auditors to see does the CECL model apply or not? Um, so we can get that incorporated in before your year end. So I keep talking about the CECL model. Let's go through what does that look like. So this is kind of CECL model in a nutshell. This ASU is almost 300 pages. So this is just kind of a drill down, you know, summary of what this looks like. So to get to your estimate for your current expected credit losses, what are we considering? We're considering historical loss experience. We're considering current conditions. Um, you're looking at differences in asset specific characteristics which guess what you guys are already doing if you have these portfolio loans. So there's nothing new there of, versus the prior methodology. So what's new with the CECL model are the next two pieces. It's going to be your reasonable and supportable future forecasting. That's a new kind of aspect with this accounting standards update, as well as the effects of reversion. So what is the effects of reversion mean to get to your CECL estimate? So the board is saying, hey, it might be hard to estimate the future over the whole life of this asset, so you can go up to where you can be reasonable and supportable in your forecast, maybe it's just two to three years, and to cover the rest of that, you can revert back to historical loss. The board's saying, hey, don't go straight back to just looking at historical, at least take a stab at it. Um, the FASB staff also drilled down in some Q&A on this guidance on the FASB website to kind of help you go through that, like, oh, how do, when do I apply effects reversion? Like, what's considered reasonable and supportable forecast? Like, what are my options here? What am I looking at? Do I actually have the means to do this? Um, they want, didn't want to have this new standard update cause, you know, undue costs and um, heartache with everybody. So those things to consider, happy to direct you to those Q&A to kind of drill down of like, what am I looking at? How do I do this? You know, this seems kind of hard to predict the future. Okay, so to create the CECL model, the board kind of listed essentially five methods to implement this on how you create this credit loss allowance. So they're listed here, have brief descriptions, and they're not saying one's right over the other, they're just saying based on your knowledge, your internal resources, you kind of decide which is the best, make sure you have a policy supporting why you chose that or why you didn't, um, and just kind of have that documented. There's a couple things to consider upon implementation. Big thing being the significant judgment, because a lot of this is subjective when you're thinking about reasonable and supportable, as well as like future forecasting. Um, so it kind of drills down in that ASU, as well as that Q&A on what you should be looking at. Please talk to Richie May, happy to have open conversation of like, 
okay, here's some things to consider when you're establishing this model, or does this model even apply for me? So I'm just gonna look at time. I don't have time to go through this example with you, but this is based off the loss rate method being applied, one of those five methods. You kind of go through and how Bank Z built their estimated credit loss on their loan to offer investment portfolio. And then this next slide is kind of just breaking it down in numbers. Again, you'll have a one line item on your balance sheet um, showing net the credit loss allowance. On um, the statement operations, you'll have your credit loss expense if you're having to adopt CECL and there's a credit loss allowance to apply. There's a couple impact on disclosures. Whenever you're adopting a new accounting policy, you have to talk about it. Um, so they're kind of listed in the ASU and we can go through that in the fall just so you can see what those look like as well. So in 2016, the CECL model, there's accounting standards updates for that. Fast forward to 2022, they made an update to this update after kind of going through this. Because remember, public entities have already been doing this for a couple of years. So the two issues they kind of recognized were issue number two was the vintage disclosures on gross write-offs. This is only applicable to public entities. First, and then the first issue being troubled debt restructuring, there was a separate guidance and methodology behind that. And they're saying, hey, you know what, let's not make this more difficult. Consider that a loan modification. And all you have to worry about is, is this a new loan or is this a continuation of an existing loan when we're thinking of this application of the CECL model? Okay, um, this now takes you to your second polling question of four. Will CECL apply to your entity's financials? Yes, no, it doesn't apply to me. Maybe, I'm not sure. So we'll give you guys about a minute to answer this question. Again, we want to make sure that if you want CPE credit, you answer this question. We are definitely answering a bit faster than we did last time, Christina, which is great. So I'll hold it open for just a couple more seconds here. It looks like everyone's in. And interesting, let me share this with everyone. Pretty even. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's see. No, it doesn't apply. Maybe I'm not sure. Okay, so I think maybe not sure. Let's make sure we have that conversation with you guys sooner than later. Um, so either don't have this looming over your head and you can just write it off or we can tackle it before we get to December um, year end. Those are kind of fun. So as an auditor, I love when numbers kind of line up like that where it's just a third, a third, a third. So, okay. So let's go into this next ASU. Um, it's gonna feel like I'm gonna breeze through it just for the sense of time right now. And it's relating to convertible debt and contracts and entities own equity. So if you're into debt financing, equity financing, this ASU might be for you. Um, what's nice about this accounting standards update, the whole premise around it was simplifying, um, making the accounting for this and disclosures more comparable and relevant. So there's a 150 page ASU related to these convertible instruments and accounting for it. And how can we make this easier? It was complex, it was inconsistent, it led to restatement of financials. So the board had a group trying to like kind of tone it down of like, okay, how can we make this a little more straightforward for the people that write up the financials and then also the users of the financials. So across the board, they see similar application of this guidance. Okay, in one breath, I'm gonna read the full guidance name. It's Accounting Standards Update 2020-6, Debt, Debt, Debt Conversion and Other Options, Subtopic 470-20, and Derivatives and Hedging Contracts and Entities Own Equity, Subtopic 815-40. Update being Accounting for Convertible Instruments and Contracts and Entities Own Equity. Took two breaths this time. Um, such a long Accounting standard Update's title. It's over 30 words, and what's it saying is, we're updating two kind of main areas in the FASB codification. One is debt drilled down to debt with conversion and other options. That's that subtopic for 70-20. We're also dealing with derivatives and hedging drilled down into the subtopic of 815-40, contracts with equ entities own equity. 
Um, so just kind of think of debt financing, equity financing as we're going through these slides. On the right-hand side, we're kind of the main convertible instruments and equity contracts affected. I do want to call out kind of the exclusion of the embedded features accounted for as derivatives of contracts being affected. Um, the embedded features being accounted for as derivatives because they fail to meet settlement conditions of a derivative scope exception. What does that mean? It's meaning that some of these contracts were classified as derivatives um, because they didn't meet the settlement conditions to classify these contracts as equity. And that's kind of what that's saying there. So you'll see the term derivative scope exception come up in a couple slides. So this goes into effect for SEC filers calendar year 2022. Um, for everybody else, it's 2024. So this is a next year thing, however you can early adopt. And since this is to help make things simple, consistent, more comparable, you might want to consider adopting this early. There were three main provisions covered in this accounting standard update. One was disclosures and updates in accounting models and methods for convertible instruments and earnings per share guidance. Uh, you removed a couple of settlement con conditions required for equity contracts. Remember that whole, some of these equity contracts were being classified as derivatives. Maybe we can kick it back over to equity. There's also a simplification in the diluted earnings per share calculation. And I'm noting the time, so I will go through this rather quickly. These slides will be available though. So first we're gonna go into convertible instruments. There were five accounting models. They're getting rid of the five. They're getting rid of the models that had separation within these models where things were reported in two areas on the financial statements. Um, they wanna show like a single liability instrument measured at amortized cost for convertible debt instruments. They're wanting to show um, convertible preferred stock as a single line item for equity instruments measured at historical cost. For contracts in, in entities own equity, what they currently had was so many different things that had an equity contract not meet the derivative scope exception. So then, then it has the derivative piece in a contract. They also noticed that some contracts would read as a derivative and very similar contracts also read as, a, as equity. So again, that comparability and consistency of accounting guidance application, um, the board was trying to get ahead of that of like, let's make this a little more consistent. So we removed some of the setbacks of getting this um, equity contract classification by removing three of the seven requirements for that settlement assessment for equ equity classification. And then the earnings per share, the calculation, there were two dilution that methods, there were two assumptions resulting in the same earnings per share information could have three different earnings per share calculations based off of what assumptions you chose and based off of what method you chose. So they removed one of those methods, they removed one of those assumptions. And FASB had some um, educational vi uh, videos to kind of show this difference in convertible instruments. So left-hand side, was with the separation model applied. Right-hand side is the update, the simplified kind of a little more streamlined. Early adoption is permitted. I'm gonna keep rolling through these. I'm sorry to go so fast. Um, and then there was kind of a list in the FASB ASU of like, okay, if you have these different, you know, freestanding instruments or embedded features, here's what the old guidance was, here's what the new guidance is to apply this in your transition, kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of what you would need to do. Um, and then there's some new disclosures. Okay, Brian, sorry, I went through that so quickly. Kicking it over to you with reference rate reform. Okay, okay, thanks, Christina. Um, so the last new pronouncement we're gonna talk about is ASU 2021-01 reference rate reform. So next slide, please. So what is it? So basically it's just, uh, getting rid of LIBOR uh, from all as an applicable interest rate benchmark. So LIBOR will be discontinued. Um, the concerns regarding LIBOR were just that it was harder to observe and susceptible to manipulation. And then this ASU gave companies temporary relief during the transition period uh, when finding a new benchmark for agreements already in place. Next slide, please. So what was updated? So they amended the definition of the Stouffer swap rates to now qualify as an applicable benchmark interest rate. Um, so that wasn't before. And then it also extended the ASU from 1231.22 to 1231.24. Uh, 
Um, this was just due to LIBOR's intended secession date. It was extended to June 30th, 2023. So they just wanted to make sure that the ASU covered longer uh, than, than the period in which LIBOR was being uh, taken away because it keeps getting pushed back. Um, because after LIBOR is go gone, or after the ASU is gone, I'm sorry, LIBOR will no longer be able to be used. Next slide, please. So what is affected? So essentially, companies will just want to review their benchmarks and interest rates for all applicable agreements. So warehouse lines, uh, master repurchase agreement, lines of credit, notes payable or receivable, and it'll just update the disclosures in the financial statement. So instead of reading, you know, LIBOR plus as your interest rate, we would expect to see SOFR or PRIME um, or any other applicable benchmark. Next slide, please. So now we're going to take a look back at some of the accounting pronouncements that went into effect in prior years that uh, we just think are good topics to kind of talk about again. Um, so our favorite topic last year was definitely leases. Um, and instead of do doing like a deep dive on leases, because I'm sure we all have a million times, we're just going to focus on a couple of year two items that we think could come up. So next slide, please. The two updates that we're going to talk about are just how to implement a lease modification and then how to account for a lease termination. Next slide, please. So for a lease modification, so the most common types of lease modifications that we'll probably see would be adding a right of use, so like adding a new office suite or a new floor, um, updating the lease term. Now, this would this wouldn't be like an option to extend in the original lease. This would be like a new extension uh, that wasn't already in there, and then any sort of updated lease payments. And then there's two ways to account for a modification. So you can either treat it as a separate contract or a separate lease altogether, or you can actually remeasure the existing asset liability. So next slide, please. So the first way to do it would be to treat it as a separate contract. So a leasee should account for a lease modification to an existing lease as a new lease, when the following conditions are met. So when the lease modification grants the leasee an additional right of use not included in the original lease, or the lease payments increase commensurate with the standalone price for the additional right of use adjusted for new lease terms. Uh, if these above conditions are met, you, you technically do not need to modify the original lease, and you can actually add this as a separate lease uh, and treat it all by itself. Next slide, please. So what to do if you have to remeasure the lease? So if any of these changes or modifications apply, you would need to remeasure the lease. Uh, so it would be adding an additional right of use, um, extending or reducing the terms. Again, it does not include like options that were already built in. Um, fully or partial termination of the lease or any other material changes. Um, and then one thing to note that is important if you do have a lease modification, you want to make sure that you remeasure the lease liability using the new discount rate at the effective date of the modification and not the original discount rate used. Next slide, please. So this is just like a quick example. Um, I can just go through real quick. So it's just like com company A is an existing 10 year lease. In year seven, the company adds an additional office suite and extends the lease nine more years. And then there was a thousand dollar fee for the modification. So what you would want to do is you would want to actually calculate the total lease liability for the new lease um, using how you would before. So the pro present value of lease payments plus, plus the updated discount rate. Um, and then you would actually true up the existing asset and liability uh, to the new calculated lease liability. And then you would expense the fees uh, incurred to modify the lease in the in the same entry in the same period. Next slide, please. So the other big thing that we might see is that a termination of a lease. So if the termination of a lease before the expiration of a lease term shall be accounted for uh, by doing the following, so you're going to want to remove the asset and liability, then you'll actually recognize either a gain or a loss for the difference. So next slide, please. So here's just like a quick example to go over, but uh, a leasee and a leasor agreed to terminate a 15 year lease after year 11. There's a penalty of $5,000 for terminating the lease. So at the time of termination, you have your asset liability. So you would write those down to zero 
and you would expense the any fees associated with terminating the lease. And then the difference in this case is a loss, but you can also have a, a gain on the lease term. Next slide, please. So this is actually the next poll question. So the question is, have you been updating lease accounting for lease modifications, including lease terminations? Yes, no, not yet, but I will by year end, or it doesn't apply. I don't have any 842 leases. I'll give you another minute just to uh, answer the question so you can get your CPE. Looks like we have almost everyone in there who has voted before. Want to make sure that you get that CPE credit if you're interested in it. So we'll just hang on a few more seconds and then get those last minute folks in there. And then I can share the results. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it now. And this is what we're looking at. Awesome, so 50% yes, so that's great. 25% not yet, but I will be by your end. That's good too. So hopefully the no's uh, you know, that is definitely something to focus on this fall, um, just so that uh, you can get it implemented and that the numbers are, we don't, we're not dealing with it uh, mid business season because it can be done now. So let's get back to these slides. So the last uh, prior ASU I'm going to talk about is ASU 2020-08, non-refundable fees and other costs. Next slide, please. So this is an amendment to ASU 2017-08. And just like a brief, uh, what ASU 2017-08 was, was this was to simplify the accounting treatment for premiums associated with callable debt securities. Uh, the objective was to improve the relevance and the usefulness of the financial reporting by better aligning premium amortization with the economic realty of the investment. So you would amortize it to the earliest call date. Next slide, please. So what, what was updated? So the updates were that the entity should now reevaluate whether a callable debt security is being amortized over the proper period. So in the original ASU that we talked about, everything was called the earliest call date. In the new update, it's now the next call date. And they define the next call date as the first call date when a call option becomes exercisable. And then once that date has passed, uh, you reset the effective yield using the debt securities updated payment terms. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Richard, or next slide, so. And then the effective dates of this, so this was uh, effective for SEC filers for 2021, and then all our other, all private entities for last year, 2022. Next slide. Now I'm gonna kick it off to Richard, who's gonna talk about the last couple. All right, great. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, stock compensation, determining the current price of an underlying share for equity classified share based awards. So we go to the we can go to the next slide. I'm briefly going to talk about the timing, um, what it is, how to implement it and and the impact uh, to your financials. Uh, so the next slide, please. Okay, so back in 2019, the private company council of FASB decided to pursue a practical expedient that would allow a non-public company to use a less complex and a, and a more cost-efficient method to determine the fair value of share option awards. So as a result of that, they issued ASU 2021 in 07, and that became a, effective for non-public companies beginning in 2022. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. The PCC received feedback that in the current in the the current price and the option pricing models was very difficult to obtain, mostly due to that fact that private company equity shares they're not traded on an open market, so you can't go to a Nasdaq or an S&P 500 and look up their share price. Um, most of the time, entities would use something called the market approach or the income approach to determine the current price input, and that was very complex and costly for them to 
to determine those those inputs. So within the scope of uh, 718 stock compensation, the PCC elected to provide a practical expedient for non-public companies uh, to help determine that current price input. So we can go to the next slide. And this practical expedient allows companies to use something called the reasonable application of a reasonable valuation method to determine the current price input. It was noted in, in the ASU that they prefer an independent appraiser uh, to be used to, to provide that valuation. And then a couple of factors that should be considered in, in that reasonable, reasonable application of the reasonable method are that it should take into account the value of your tangible and intangible assets. Uh, it should take into account the present value of your anticipated future cash flows. And that if you've had a valuation done of your assets and your stock within like the previous 12 months, you may be able to use that same valuation to value your current price input. Uh, an additional item within the ASU was that it clarified that if you need the valuation for your treasury regulations, that the valuation will also satisfy this practical expedient. So in another effort to reduce costs, you can use one valuation and also satisfy both IRS and GAAP requirements. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, and so honest, so the impact is just that the goal of the FASB was to make the option pricing model for your equity share awards a little bit less costly and complex to, to calculate. So to that extent, this practical expedient is designed to make the hardest, uh, the hardest aspect, the fair value of their equity shares, is designed to make that a little bit easier to obtain. And with that, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the next ASU I'm gonna talk about is uh, targeted improvements to related party guidance for variable interest in entities. And the next slide. And again, I'm gonna cover the timing, what it is and, and the impact to you know the financial statements. So we can go to the next slide, please. So this one actually dates back to uh, 2015, when stakeholders began expressing concern to the FASB about guidance for uh, either consolidating variable interest entities or recognizing them as uh, entities under common control. So in 2016, the FASB proposed an update to applying the VIE guidance. And then in 2018, ASU 2018-07 was, um, was was put was published by FASB and it became effective for public entities in 2020 and for private companies in 2021. We can go to the next slide. And what this what the ASU provided is that gave a, uh, a, gave a private company accounting alternative where they did not have to apply variable interest entity to legal to other legal ent entities that are under common control. A couple of caveats to that, though, is that the entity and the parent must not be public companies. And then this applies to all current and future legal ent entities that are under common control. So if at some point in the future, one of your, you know, either the parent or the another entity under common control becomes public, then uh, this guidance will no longer be in effect for you. Uh, current gap before this ASU allowed for leasing arrangements under common control to not be applied, not have to apply the VIE guidance. So in essence, what this did was expand GAAP to all private company common control arrangements. And a couple of the goals from FASB was to have a little bit more consistent application on whether private companies applied the VIE guidance or if they just disclosed some common control companies. Um, and as part of this ASU, it had provided um, enhanced disclosures about uh, involvement with and exposure to legal ent entities under common control. And with that, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so the impact of this is that it's likely that more non-public companies are going, going to determine that they do not have to evaluate uh, for a VIE consolidation, that they're going to be able to rely on uh, companies under common control, and it should provide more consistency within uh, the non-public companies. And we can go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the next, actually, I've got two ASCs I'm going to talk about, but they're both under the same umbrella of goodwill. So one is to simplify the tests for goodwill impairment, and the other is to evaluate for triggering events, which would necessitate a need for goodwill impairment. 
Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. And again, I'm going to cover the timing of what they are, how to implement, and the impact on them. So we can go to the next slide. Awesome. So ASU 2017-04 became effective in 2022. And what it's what it did was it uh, simplified the test for goodwill impairment. And in the second, I'll kind of get a little bit more into the details on that. ASU 2021-03 uh, was issued in 2021 and it discussed when to account, when to evaluate triggering events and the need for a goodwill impairment. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so ASU 2017-04, you know, the test for goodwill impairment it modified the impairment from the carrying amount of goodwill exceeding its fair value to when the carrying amount of just a reporting unit exceeds its fair value. And then the other key aspect to this is that it eliminated the need for step two of the goodwill impairment test. And part of the goal or the part of the goal or the aim of FASB on that was to make it a little bit less costly and complex. And then also by removing step two of the impairment test, it more closely aligned GAP with some IFER standards. Um, and then it also had some additional financial statement disclosures for Goodwill uh, to report those on a reporting unit basis. And we can go to the next slide. Cool, so this one, ASU 2021-03 discussed uh, triggering events. So under the previous guidance, you would need to almost continually assess if a triggering event had occurred where you would need to um, look at good if there was an impairment of goodwill. So as an example, like if you had in Q2 of a given year and you lost half of your you know branches and lost half of your production, under the prior guidance you would have had to you know assess a triggering of that was a triggering event. In the with the current guidance, say you were Redu replace those branches in Q3 so that by the end of the year you had basically the same production level um, and there was you know no longer a triggering event for impairing goodwill. That kind of aimed to make it a little bit easier for companies so that they could just take a step back at 1231 and look back at the prior year to see if there was any kind of trigger triggering events. A couple of the examples of triggering events would include industry or market considerations, and then overall financial statement performance, such as declining or negative cash flows. Um, you know, we've seen in the mortgage industry, in particular in 2022, and, and unfortunately continuing in 2023, it's been a little bit tougher, you know, as far as like a mortgage loan production basis. So if you had a business combination in 2021 and recognize some goodwill, given the market conditions in the last year, year and a half, Probably at the end of 12, 31, 23, 23, you'll really want to take a look at to see if there's, you know, market conditions within our industry that might be a triggering event where you may need to impair that goodwill. Um, okay, uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, and again, just kind of a summary, this just on these two ASUs, um, the first one simplified the goodwill impairment test. And then the other one allows companies to assess for a goodwill impairment triggering event at the end of any reporting period. So that's either your, your fiscal year, year end, or if you have certain quarterly requirements up to a parent company, then you can assess at that point. And we can go to the next one. And this one is, we've run to our next polling question. So do you think your company may have a triggering event in 2023? And your options are yes, no, maybe depending on how q4 of 23 um, goes and then doesn't apply to me because we don't have any goodwill on our books and with that we'll give you a minute to answer that question this is our last poll question please answer this if you would like to get your cpe oh they're coming in fast richard so it should just be a moment. We have almost the entire population that answered the first three. We want to make sure we get everyone that fourth question. If you haven't answered now yet, I need you to answer. Oh, great. A bunch of people just heard that. <laughs> okay, looks like everybody's in. I'll go ahead and close this and share the answers. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So 
Nice. About 40% of people don't have to worry about that, don't have goodwill. Um, you know, I think for the knower, maybe it just might be something to take a look at, you know, discuss with your auditor in Q4 as we're doing our planning and interim procedures, and we should be good to go. Um, and I think uh, now with that, I think we'll have the other presenters join back in and we'll do a quick recap of um, everything that we've gone through today. I know we covered a lot of material, so we thought it would be a good idea to, to do a quick hit from everybody once again. So. Chad, I'll send it out to you for a first couple of points recap. Awesome. Um, yeah, the first one with the common control arrangements that I went through, the main things to remember here is that common control arrangement ASU will only impact entities with related party or common control arrangements. Um, and on one of the CPE questions, we did have some say that they weren't sure on the impact. So again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us to, to discuss that. Um, and the last two that I went through, you know, financial services, the, the transition for sold contracts, and the derivatives and hedging. Um, the biggest takeaway on these two is the updates will not impact the majority of our clients, but if you are insured, please, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. Pass this on to Christina. Thanks, Chad. Uh, so I guess two takeaways on my accounting standard updates. Let's start with the credit losses. So if you have assets measured at amortized costs, you have loan sell for investment, or if you're not sure if it's loan sell for investments or age loan sell for sale, let's talk to see if the CECL model does apply. Uh, second thing would be um, reread the slides on convertible instruments if you have that with debt financing or equity financing because I really breezed through those quickly because I knew we only had an hour. So I, sorry to the audience about that, um, but happy to discuss about anything about convertible instruments. Again, you can early apply that in 2023. Uh, kicking it over to you, Brian. Yeah, just two two quick takeaways for mine. Uh, so for leases, any sort of modifications you guys might have. Just make sure when you remeasure that you're using the updated discount rate and not the original one. And then for the reference rate reform, just remember if you're still using LIBOR uh, as a benchmark for in any agreements to start the process to amend them if you haven't already. And what about you, Richard? Uh, you know, I'll just revisit, uh, you know, Goodwill again, the change in one you have to assess for if there was a triggering event that may I'll lead to a goodwill impairment and then honestly the biggest one was the, the stock comp on making trying to make it a little bit easier to get that current price input on your uh, stock option pricing model thank you all i know we're almost at the end of time but we did get one question that i'd like to just throw out to the presenters to make cecil implementation easier related to loans held for investment can we just base the allowance on appraisals? Okay, Felicia. Um, so just basing it on appraisals, you have to think the CECL model, you're taking information relevant to assessing collectability of cash flow. So I don't know if just an appraisal does that because you're also having to consider historical, current events, future forecasting. Um, I just don't think an appraisal would capture all of that for you under the CECL model. And then Chad, did you want to chime in on that? Because I know you've gotten a couple one-off CECL questions. Yeah, you know, we've gotten this kind of a question quite a bit because it is intimidating for this guidance where it's a lot of future forecasting and, and outlook and it's a little intimidating with that piece. So, um, but the, typically the only time you would really compare the UPB of a loan to a third party valuation, such as an appraisal, when evaluating CECL would be as if you elect a practical expedient um when borrowers are only facing financial difficulties so the reason like you know the reason for this is like christina said is you are more relying on um cash proceeds the future cash flows received from that borrower on a monthly basis opposed to selling the uh, selling the property or the loan and the same goes with uh, using scratch and dent valuations um since the entity is not relying on the cash proceeds from a scratch and dent sell that would not necessarily be a true picture of what losses you are going to face in the future, especially when a loan is performing. Um, and I think this is where CECL becomes difficult is because you're having to rely on other factors to determine that loss. Um, one of the easy, easier ways that Christina mentioned earlier is, is you know, but that but can't be the only way is basing the losses on historical experience. Um, so if historically a pool of loans have shown maybe a loss of uh, a rate of X, that would be uh, a good basis of what future losses may look like. Um, and if not a lot of history on the loans and they have been performing, you would expect a zero allowance based on that history 
But then, you know, like Christina said, again, where the CISO model now wants you to predict what future losses may look like based on how, you know, the market's doing, the industry and the overall economy. Um, and that's really the base of it all. But we, you know, please let us know. We could discuss further on that. Thank you, Chad. And I know we're just a minute over time, but I wanted to remind everyone that we will be sending out the recording to this along with the slides. And we did have a hand raised earlier in the presentation, but no question along with that hand raise. So I want to encourage everyone to just send your questions in to, if we could go to the next slide, um, info at richiemay.com, and one of these experts will get back to you right away, or reach out directly to your Richie May point of contact. And we'll make sure that we answer these questions for you. Thank you all again for attending today. And we look forward to seeing you on our next mortgage banking webinar. Thank you and have a great day.